Well, hello, everybody. Um, this is Rafi Neiman. And uh, this is part two of week five, femoral diaphysis of the uh, Osteotomy Weekly AO course. So um, I'm joined today by several panel members, the folks that you met on Saturday, uh, which is Mark Lee, Steve Quinnen, and Matt Graves. And we also have a host of our other uh, AO faculty from the course here today. We will be recording, so it may not be applicable to all of you, but make sure that your camera and microphones are turned off. Uh, what will be important today uh, is because this is an Ask the Expert session where we're going to have case discussions, you're going to have the ability to ask us questions. And uh, when you do so, please only use the Q&A function to ask the questions. If you send them in the chat, then Number one, we may not be looking there, but number two, it doesn't get archived, so we can't uh, go back and look at those later and address those questions as the meeting progresses. So uh, use the Q&A. On Saturday, we had, uh, we had uh, four main topics for femoral shaft, uh, and in those topics, we discuss indications for diaph uh, femoral diaphysis deformity correction, um, some of the techniques to ex uh, restore extraarticular alignment, uh, we touched on non-union treatment, uh, and we also went through uh, some of the strategies for leg lengthening and bone transport. Today, we're going to review some of those and uh, take a little bit deeper dive with a few cases to illustrate those points. Uh, I shared with you on Saturday uh, some of the aspects of angular deformity correction, and uh, with that, I had a couple of uh, key points. Uh, one of them was that you need to be able to uh, determine your maximum and minimum plane of deformity in order to achieve your correction. So you can't do an angular correction if you are not in uh, the right plane. So uh, we went through some of the uh, steps and how to determine that uh, maximum and min deformity. Uh, but basically where this eye is looking is going to show you the min deformity seen at the bottom right. And if you look orthogonal to that, you'll see the max deformity. Uh, and I will refer you back to the, uh, to the YouTube or uh, Zoom archive of that lecture if you want to get the details for how I, I went through that. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time discussing uh, principles of deformity correction using the CORA method. Center of rotation of angulation is CORA. Uh, and I use a term called the ACA, which is the angulation correction axis. And the ACA is the, is the axis about which you spin one fragment with relationship to the other. So that's really the key to uh, deformity correction for angular corrections. And uh, with that were some rules. And uh, one of the adaptations of the rules is uh, if you make your cut through the, uh, through the Cora and you spin it around uh, that ACA through the Cora, then you're going to get collinear realignment. Um, and that doesn't necessarily matter if you cut uh, directly through the bisector, like the green line, or if you have an oblique osteotomy, as long as it gets through the cora, you're going to get collinear realignment. And we discussed some of the implications for that, including excising non-unions. Um, uh, I talked about uh, another rule where if you're spinning your, your ACA is through the cora, if your cut is below or above the cora, uh, you can still get collinear realignment or angular correction without any translation. Uh, and one application of that, which we illustrated, was the use of the focal dome. Uh, and we uh, showed a technique for achieving that. It has limitations, like you can't really do much translation unless it's in the direction of that, um, in, of that focal dome. Uh, there were questions about uh, rule three in the Q&A uh, on Saturday. And I had mentioned that um, rule three is where you, you, have, you determine what your CORA is, but then your cut and your ACA are not in the CORA. And if that happens, then you're going to get translation. And that can either be a bad thing if you didn't intend it, or it could be a good thing if you did intend it. And uh, someone asked, when would it be a good idea? And I just uh, pulled up this example of somebody who has a varus femur, but it's varus in the diaphysis, but uh, it's also varus in the hip, but uh, a high amount of valgus in the distal femur. So um, in a case like this, if you want to correct their mechanical axis, uh, then you can control that with a series of cuts. For example, I have 
determined where the Cora is, but I don't rotate through the Cora. And if you look and uh, you see that as the uh, opening wedge osteotomy uh, progresses, uh, you get uh, a translation of uh, the mechanical axis uh, to meet the other side uh, with a with an osteotomy that's not in the Cora. So it's kind of a tough concept and uh, really in order to get through that, you're gonna wanna to get the book um, by Dror Paley that I mentioned, Principles of Deformity Correction. So uh, with angular corrections, we talked about these uh, topics in uh, the first 15 minutes uh, on Saturday. Uh, next, we went into Mark Lee's uh, topic, which was uh, rotational deformities. Uh, and Mark did a really nice job of giving you very practical uh, points on on how to how to do this, um, and some of these are critical. Really, uh, he went through some of the uh, the reasons uh, or the indications for that, uh, and really that there's uh, a high degree of, um, of malrotations out there when we nail femurs and. And that point hit home to me uh, just two days ago in my trauma clinic. Uh, I saw one of my own patients who I just nailed uh, and, uh, and his external rotation was over 20 degrees. Uh, and I was unhappy about that. Uh, so these, these happen to all of us, even uh, when we're extremely careful and you just have to, it's what you do about it that, uh, that matters. The patient uh, is gonna tell you what their symptoms are. And the more demanding the patient is, the more symptomatic they're going to be. So somebody who's sedentary may not mind having an external rotation deformity, but those who are very active are going to have uh, really quite a bit of disability with, with high amounts of rotational deformity. Uh, the other thing is that it's really hard to get a good clinical exam on patients if they, uh, unless they have a, a really large amount of rotation. Uh, Mark Lee also showed us uh, some of the techniques for achieving rotational corrections. Uh, he showed us external and internal corrections. This is an internal uh, osteotomy with uh, a cam and a blade, and you, uh, you can rotate the blade to um, more of it protrude, and you can get a pretty precise cut. Uh, this is a, an example of, of you've got reference pins, and uh, you may see here you've got a goniometer. You're uh, estimating the rotation that you just achieved uh, to, to make sure that that's uh, what you intended. Um, here's another example that uh, one of our other faculty members uh, uh, shared with me and his method, which is in addition to your reference pins, uh, if you have additional pins where the chance pin holders are, these two here, you can use those to uh, actually perform the rotational correction so that uh, you don't loosen your pins. For example, if this is osteoporotic bone or if it's a difficult correction, you're not actually bending the pins that you're using for your reference. So uh, that's a nice, uh, nice tip to add there. Um, but one of the, the main points uh, that, that Mark wanted to make, and we all made it, is that uh, these are diaphyseal corrections. Uh, diaphyseal bone does not heal like the, uh, the metaphyseal bone that we were dealing with in the proximal femur, or you will be next week with distal femur. Uh, these do not tolerate uh, fixed gaps very well. And uh, even just a small misalignment of your cut, if you're not perfectly perpendicular to your long axis, you can get a few degrees off. And as Mark is showing from the left to the right, uh, that rotation gets magnified and you end up with a gap. So uh, hopefully we'll get into the details a little bit today about um, some other strategies for how to avoid that. Uh, so basically, his, his uh, summary was that these patients' um, complaints are what really are going to drive your uh, desire for correction, uh, and the technique is really critical. Next, we had Steve Quinnen uh, show us some uh, pretty amazing stuff on the evolution of uh, deformities of length and how uh, we've moved uh, so far in such a short amount of time. Um, Axial translations of the femur, it's really, uh, it, this is a, another translation just instead of uh, X and Y or, or coronal and sagittal translations, now we're talking about translations of, uh, of length in the, uh, in the long axis. Um, there are a lot of methods available to us now, and depending on which part of the world you're in, uh, some of these are going to be more available to you than others. Um, Steve uh, showed us uh, some of the uh, the current techniques, which include monolateral fixators or, or rails, uh, 
uh, circular uh, fixators, which are quite honestly a, a lot more cumbersome in the femur than they are in the tibia. Uh, and these include uh, traditional uh, ring uh, fixators such as the Ilazarov uh, method or hexapod, which is the, uh, the six struts that you can use to uh, obtain not just length, but uh, angular corrections at the same time. Um, and then he showed us some of the, uh, the other techniques which will reduce the amount of time that you're in those frames because the frames have a significant complication rate on their own. So adding uh, other devices to your frame, such as a rod in this case, or a plate, or using cables to assist in your transport, these are the ways of, uh, of shortening the time in your frame. Uh, Steve then just went uh, into the all internal devices and the evolution of those. Um, there are those that are mechanical only devices such as the ISKD. Um, and then there are, are internally motorized uh, versions which are um, magnetic and, and there are some that are electromechanical as well. Uh, and these are really going to transform um, a bone uh, lengthening procedures as you see here, but not just bone lengthening, but bone transport um, as we start to see these devices uh, in use uh, more often. Uh, he sh showed us uh, his indications uh, were basically for limb length discrepancies and congenital uh, issues. Um, and in these uh, times when it's available to you, uh, internal nails are really preferred uh, just to decrease the number of uh, complications, but it's not always available or in, uh, in environments of infection, then those are not uh, uh, the implant of choice and you wanna move to the external fixator devices such as the rails. Uh, and finally, we topped off our, uh, our session uh, Saturday with um, Matt Graves' uh, discussion of multiplanar correction. Uh, and his topic was um, the clamshell osteotomy. And this is something that uh, he uh, helped to um, refine uh, and published. And so these diagrams are actually from uh, one of uh, the publications that he was part of. Uh, and if you, if you find uh, the JBJS uh, publication that uh, shows the technique for this, it's, it pretty much describes everything that you need to know in a stepwise fashion. And actually some of the things that they learned since the time that they published the first paper. Uh, so I encourage everybody to, to look at uh, that. It's a low energy osteotomy, you can tell, uh, because they're using drill bits to cut the, uh, the long axis instead of using a saw. To, uh, so they're, they're trying to decrease the amount of, uh, of heat to the bone uh, to correct the deformity. And it was really developed as a, because necessity is the mother of invention uh, in, in the location that, uh, that it was developed. Um, the beauty is in its simplicity uh, and so is its elegance, but but what's also uh, an important point that Matt Graves gave us was that uh, compared to uh, the topic that I had, which was uh, you know, closing wedge osteotomies and angular corrections, those require a high level of precision in order to get your, uh, your plane uh, right and your cuts right. But uh, there's a much larger margin uh, available to you for uh, multiplanar correction with the clamshell osteotomy. Um, there are limitations to its use. Uh, and uh, some of them are soft tissue. Uh, some of them are that it is, uh, the, the nail is gonna bear all your load uh, and you have to be very good with your uh, I am nailing techniques and be able to do metaphyseal nailing very well uh, in order for, these, uh, for this technique to work for you. So uh, that, was our, that was our Saturday uh, topics. Uh, right now we're gonna go into some uh, question and answers. And what I'll do is I'll ask uh, uh, some of my panel members to look through the Q&A and tell me if we have any new questions uh, to discuss. Uh, yeah, if, a couple, Rafi. Okay, so um, does somebody want to curate those for me and, uh, and uh, as I get, yeah. We're, there's two that you could do right now if you want to. All right, let's do them. Um, so the question is, when you perform lengthening of the femur, either by, by any technique, essentially, whether it's an external fixator or over a nail or a combination, do you need to be concerned about the change in the coronal alignment since 
it seems like we're correcting the anatomical access rather than the mechanical access. Well, yeah, that's a really, uh, that's a great question. Um, let's, let's actually let um, Steve start with that answer. Um, and then, um, then actually we'll, I have one of the three cases that I have will actually demonstrate a little bit of, uh, of what he's gonna talk about. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. That's actually a, a fairly sophisticated question. Um, and it's true. So the mechanical axis and the anatomical axis in the femur diverge on average by about seven to 10 degrees. And, you know, it depends on the particular patient just how much of a difference there is. So when we lengthen a femur along the anatomical axis, which any internal device is going to do, that's one thing that is fundamentally different than with external fixation, where we can lengthen along the mechanical axis instead. Um, if you're doing that, you need to recognize from the very beginning that you will influence the position of the mechanical axis relative to the knee. And as you lengthen the femur further, you are going to laterally translate or in effect create a pseudovalgus of the knee by by doing that. Now, the amount that that actually happens varies depending on the individual patient's difference between mechanical and anatomic axis. So it's not always the same, but generally speaking, if you're going a centimeter, it's you're gonna move it about a millimeter over. So if you're doing two or three millimeters, it's probably pretty minimal and not a big deal. If you're going to, you know, seven plus, centimeters, then you really start to get to move it enough that it, it may be relevant. And you may need to uh, anticipate that and build it into your plan. Um, I think um, one of the examples that we do have later shows how you can use it to your advantage. Um, but it could also end up to your disadvantage, especially if the patient initially starts out with a somewhat lateral line or a bit of valgus. So I think that sort of is a summary of mainly the issue. Yeah, um, it is. It is a pretty complex uh, th process to have to think about in, in in real time as it's lengthening. Um, Mark, Matt, you guys do lengthening procedures? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I think you guys answered it well. I guess the one the one thing I would say that you know just sort of highlights the fact that we have advantage these days with digital planning that we can actually you know, distract it out on digitally and, and see how the axis change happens. And so, you know, I think that just sort of, you know, reflects back a little bit on the earlier things we've talked about in this course. It's just nice to be able to these days, you know, not just draw it, but actually, you know, look at the different deformations that you get with that distraction. So, yeah. Be but but it is a really good thing to remember when you start because your only chance to really affect a change to prevent the final outcome from changing is when you place the nail in the first place. So you, you, it is a really good thing to think of when you're planning your case to make sure that you put that into the plan. Hmm. Yeah, that's higher level because when you start think, if you think of your, you're just doing a purely anatomic axis uh, correction, it, it isn't. So um, we have a couple of other questions. Um, and they're, they're actually, this is perfect because we got one for each of the three of you. Uh, that one was for Steve. Um, I'll give this to Mark. Um, uh, I'll read the question. Uh, it says, in case of bilateral excessive femoral, femoral antiversion in adults, uh, do you advise to do bilateral correction with IM nails in the same setting or do you stage it? And what factors should uh, you take into consideration when planning such a case? Yeah, I don't have any evidence on that. I can't say I've actually done that, but I mean, I think it's sort of the same consideration for doing prophylactic nailing. You're, you're nailing an intact femur if you're going to use that technique. So I guess there would be ways that you could definitely reduce the risk of, I think you're referring to some concern about, you know, mobilization of the marrow contents into the systemic circulation and potential problems with that. And I think that's a, a real concern with any nailing procedure. And, and we do point out that this is a, you know, it's a femur and, and it's an osteotomy. So we are going to be doing reaming of significance, pressurizing the canal for sure. So, yeah, I don't know if I could tell you for sure that doing a, the normal venting you might do if you're doing prophylactic nailing. We definitely, 
will do venting of the femur. But one thing to think about, uh, you know, all these osteotomies, you are, you know, you know, you are sort of fracturing the bone with the osteotomy. You are decreasing the the, the pressure. So. Yeah, I guess I would say, you know, if you're really worried about it, you could vent it. I, I don't know if there's probably higher risk with doing this than doing bilateral, you know, prophylactic nailing, which some people will do in a staged fashion, but other people will have less of a problem with. So to answer the question directly, I, I think it's feasible to do it. If you're really worried about it, you can vent the femur um, in, the, in the zone of the nail, within the, within the confines of the nail, and it's probably safe. Yeah, a few weeks ago, um, when we were looking at cases in the proximal femur, uh, they, one of the panelists uh, discussed using a uh, rea suction device to decompress the canal as you're reaming. Um, if you do that on both femurs in somebody and you're not expedient with it, you can remove a pretty significant blood volume if you did that twice. So uh, that is something to think about. It's a good, it's a good, uh, Good thing to think about uh, when you're doing Rhea, a lot of stuff. It makes sense. Re is expensive too. I mean, I, I don't know if I, I need it necessarily. I mean, that is why it was developed and mm -hmm. not really how yeah. it's used. But I, I think it's pretty expensive. And I think you can vent the femur. Lots of people describe, you know, simple large caliber drill holes yeah. or using the, you know, the, you can just open your X fix set and, you know, drill for the caliber of this, one of the outer sleeves. There's lots of ways to vent. Yeah. I don't think it has to yeah. be a specific company's technique or product. Right. It just, it, it ends up being a lot of surgery, especially uh, if you're doing maybe a pure correction, a rotational correction, where it's a relatively simple, uh, <laughs> I say simple in quotes, but uh, one, you have one step, main step to the operation, but sometimes you're doing multiple corrections in one procedure. You're doing an angular correction and a rotational correction. You may be doing two sites on the femur. When you start adding all that time, um, it, it is. It does get a little more risky, but the re the real appeal to doing it is uh, you get it all done in one operation. And the other part of it is you really uh, make sure that you've got all your factors uh, for your comparing rotation, uh, both of them at the same time using the same techniques. And so that that may be. Yeah, and and it's more maybe more apropos to 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 the clamshell and Matt can comment on it. It does come into play for any time you osteotomize the femur. You know, if you're talking about doing multiple corrections, these are not, some of these will bleed a lot. And so I think yeah. that's the point you were making, Rafi. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't ever perceive this as a low blood loss procedure for sure, regardless of technique. And I, I think it's true for rotations, but I think it's particularly true for clamshell. I, I think one of the other things too is even apart from the safety margin, which is totally valid, is... Um, just practically speaking, it's a lot easier for a patient to have a good leg when you osteotomize their femur for a couple months before you do the other one, because they yeah. can kind of have a relatively normal life with one good leg, but if you cut both, they're pretty much down for a while. <laughs> yep. Well, let's, um, I'd say we can start looking at a couple of cases. Um, let, let's go into, um, Let's go into PowerPoint for a second. Can, uh, can everybody see this uh, case discussion screen? Yes. Okay. So um, we have a few cases to discuss. I, I picked um, some for each of our topics. And, uh, and then if we have extra time at the end, we'll, we'll go over a few others. But uh, we'll, I'll, I'll start with one of these cases. Uh, this is uh, a 55-year-old woman who uh, was referred to me from one of the arthroplasty surgeons in my community. Uh, she went to him because uh, she had a total joint on the other side and her leg lengths were unequal. She was having hip pain uh, and then she started getting thigh pain. Uh, so she came to see him and he, uh, he, he saw her and, and asked me to, to get involved with her. Um, Basically, she had had a prior uh, fracture of her femur, uh, plated with this uh, long um, condylar screw, basically uh, a long plate. Uh, she has fibrous dysplasia, but she has a form of it called McCune-Albright because she has some uh, other uh, 
uh, factors, uh, and it's polyostotic. So she has a couple of different uh, extremities that are affected by her fibrous dysplasia. Not her other femur, actually, but, um, and she's had thigh pain for a couple of months, so uh, for several months. So these are the, the images that were shared uh, by the other surgeon with me. Uh, and um, what is of concern here uh, is, is the, this, there's a fracture that she has, uh, that she has developed. So um, we'll just sort of take it back a step and, and ask um, Mark, what do you think the, the cause of the fracture is and, and what, what, it, what worries about you about it? Yeah, that fracture is it. That's an interesting fracture. I mean, she obviously has the the frontal deformity, and it's interesting. It looks like a seems like it's propagating from the the screw track there. So she's likely, you know, that screw likely is the the propagation site for what's essentially a stress fracture or insufficiency situation related to her frontal deformity. Yeah. Yeah, probably just a, she's starting to get some tension failure. If you look at what um, what she looked like two years prior um, to her thigh pain, she she had a relatively straight femur. So I think as it's as it's bowing, additionally, it's it's the lateral sides under tension. So I got a CT scan. Just uh, I wanted to to just understand this deformity a little bit better. Um, and I'm only showing you this because uh, just to appreciate the maximum minimum deformity, we're not in the coronal and sagittal planes, um, but she has a high degree of, of deformity to the femur consistent with her fibrous dysplasia. So um, I did not put these marks on here, but um, the radiologist did. I think that, that there's actually a larger leg length inequality than what is shown here. I think her, her hip centers on the, on the right side is not quite right. So. Um, Matt, um, what do you, what are, what are the, what are the problems you like to list, uh, when you're, when you're dealing with these sort of, uh, cases, you, you kind of have a problem list and then you start to address those and, and what, what can you do about it? So what, what are the problems and what do you want to do about it? Yeah, sure. So I think the first problem would be uh, the potential for metabolic bone issues. Um, and I would want to know that she had the potential to heal because it's unusual, I would think uh, starting with a straight femur, which it seems like she did uh, to develop this significant amount of uh, varus um, and apex or apex anterolateral uh, angulation, if you will. So uh, I'd make sure that she had the metabolic potential to heal uh, just like I would for a non-union. The second problem would be osteoporosis. So she has significantly thin cortices. It looks like her, um, from best I can tell, it appears that her, um, trabecular uh, pattern in her femoral head is not good. Uh, she has bone defects, uh, especially the, the screw for the DCS proximally, that's a significant bone defect, but she also has erosions around uh, the screws that are uh, along the shaft. She has broken screws, I think. It looks like the distal three or so screws are broken at least. I may be wrong on that, is that right? That uh, I'm not sure those screws are actually broken. I think yeah. it's uh, I think it's just a CT scan. Okay, that's good. That. that makes life yeah. a little bit better. So yeah, they're not. There's no broken hardware. Yeah, that's good. Um, and then then of course um, her age and the deformity. Uh, and so she's, yeah. you know, the deformity is significant uh, for sure. Uh, and it's over a very long segment. It's not a it's not an acute focal deformity. It's over a long long segment. And so she. She has a number of problems that are important to think about at least. Yeah, I, actually, I, I'm glad you pointed out the long segment part of that. And, um, and that will come into play actually, as, as you look at, um, as, as you look at what we do. So what, um, so when she did, when she got her metabolic workup, um, she was not uh, hypophosphatemic. I actually checked that just because just like everybody else, I, I looked up McCune Albright and fibrous dysplasia and bone healing, and I was worried that uh, there were going to be other issues besides the what I can see on the X-ray. Uh, she had pretty much a normal metabolic workup, except for vitamin D was low, so uh, that was 
corrected as we, uh, we started to treat her. Um, the other part is that she has an, probably an acute uh, fracture that, you know, that's the, re the reason for her thigh pain. So that sort of uh, accelerates the timeline of, of what to do with her. She's just having a lot more pain. We didn't touch on it, Rafi, but you got this, it's just a couple quick questions. We got the, C you got the CT to help you look at the bone, the alignment, or was that for a rotational evaluation? <laughs> Help me understand. I, yeah. I, I wouldn't typically get a CT in this setting. I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what the role of the CT was for you there. Well, so with these, with this fibrous dysplasia, I wanted to see how big were these lesions? Were they, did they erode through all the way through the cortex in some places? If I'm going to be planning some osteotomy like a clamshell, um, do I, is there a different longitudinal axis that I choose rather than just the, you know, the mid sagittal? Um, the other thing I wanted to know about was what was going on in this head. You know, what was what was going on with this implant um, up here? How how loose was it, and was I going to have to do any countermeasures for that? So for me, um, I know, and it, I know we don't always get CTs on uh, on every on every long bone deformity, but I felt in this case that. Um, I wanted to study that fracture a little bit better, and I wanted to, to see what the, what the rest of the, the bone health looked like for when I was going to cut into it. Of and, course, you've got the these reason, giant plates. The reason I brought it up was that I, I don't, it doesn't really help me, I don't think, for the looking at the frontal and sagittal necessarily. And, and for sure, we know, I, I just think it's critical for the rotational under, analysis and understanding that. Mm -hmm. And I do hear, and I've heard in this course and other places that you know, you don't necessarily need the continuous CT top to bottom. But I will say this is that, you know, when I'm dealing with a patient like this and I'm envisioning a patient with dealing with a patient who has bad bone or suboptimal bone, and I'm thinking about an intramedullary solution, I frequently do actually use the CT. I like actually the continuous CT through the femur. And, and it is also not, you know, not to look at the lesions necessarily. That's a very specific but also to understand a little bit more about the intramedullary anatomy because yeah. you know, it's helpful for me to know, you know, isthmic diameters, narrowings, any abnormalities that you're, you, you'd be quite surprised sometimes that, you know, especially in a post-fracture situation, you know, a canal that seems continuous is not continuous or it's particularly wide and we can get very good measurements of width that can, can affect the technique. So. I was just suggesting that I don't think the CT maybe would, would be helpful for me for the deformity analysis in terms of the frontal or sagittal, but I think right. there's some value to CT if you're thinking about an intramedullary solution. And it, to me, it's most helpful when it's continuous. I don't know if it's different yeah. for the other panelists. No, I think that makes perfect sense for me. Yeah, Matt, you've talked about um cavitation uh, with some of the existing implants that are intramedullary when you're going to correct stuff. And um, you can look down in her distal femur and she may not have cavitation there in the usual sense, but she's definitely got some sort of um, abnormal bone there. So yeah. it's kind of helpful to, to know where that is. Um, so I, I did decide to do a clamshell osteotomy on her. And what I'd like uh, is for uh, Matt to sort of pick apart um, what, um, what's, what's good and not good about this, uh, particular, uh, clamshell, um, as far as, uh, a starting point, uh, or, um, the type of nail that you're using, um, you mentioned this in your lecture last week, um, you use the word on, on axis nail, but, um, you want to just explain <laughs> that for a second. Yeah, so what I was trying to say, uh, and it may not have come across clearly to everyone, is an anatomic axis entry point. So uh, either a piriformis fossa nailing procedure, or if you're using a cephalomedullary nail, just slide anterior to the piriformis fossa nailing procedure, or um, a retrograde nailing procedure with a central starting point at the apex of Blumensatz line. So I find that that makes the correction significantly easier uh, assuming you can get in the correct position in the proximal and distal segment. Uh, it really uh, decreases the complexity of the coronal and sagittal plane uh, reduction for me. And so I prefer uh, 
doing this with a um, an on axis or a, a piriformis start nail in this case. Yeah. Yeah, and if you draw the line, you actually look like it looks like I may have even my trajectory looks like it's it's not even I, I could have made it even more uh, heading more lateral. Yeah, and, this is a really interesting case. And one of the participants asked the question, Dr. Bayati asked the question, um, what are the absolute limitations to the clamshell <clears throat> osteotomy? And I, yeah. I, I was a little bit unclear on exactly what, uh, what was meant. Uh, was that contraindications or was that uh, limitations of correction? Because both are very important. And I think, you know, the contraindications, uh, one, I would choose a clamshell for this uh, deformity for sure. I think it's the, I think it's a very nice procedure for uh, long bowing deformities like this. The so field is another way to do it, but I, I think the clamshell is nice. Uh, so the things that would make it contraindicated would be the, you know, the inability to do metaphyseal nailing procedures, which are required in this case, uh, or uh, inability to access the canal itself uh, or absence of a canal in the proximal and distal segments. So there, there are a few things that would make, uh, that would be legitimate contraindications, but I don't think she has any of those. So the, the next thing that absolute limitation could mean was um, uh, what are the limitations for correction with a clamshell osteotomy? And I think this case is great because it demonstrates a real challenge with the clamshell. So if you're truly going to get to a segment that is not deformed, you're going to have to make an osteotomy at the inferior aspect of the lesser troch in this patient. And if you don't, and you use an on-axis or a piriformis start nail, then it's going to be exceedingly hard to get in the correct position. Um, and I've actually had this happen to me in the tibia for a severe deformity of the tibia where my osteotomy was not extreme enough. It, it wasn't proximal and distal enough in order to allow me to get to a, a portion of the bone where I could be in the central portion of the anatomic axis because of the severity of the bowing. And, you know, we tend to resist that because we want to have longer working length of the intramedullary nail within right. the segment that we're treating. Uh, but that can get you in trouble. So in your preoperative planning, you have to, you have to factor that in. Um, where does the bowing start and how is that going to affect my osteotomy and my stability postoperatively? Yeah. So. Hey, Matt, one other thing, just, you know, and it's obviously a little more, everything's a little more concerning in the tibia for this osteotomy, but yeah. the other thing to think about is, and I think Steve might have a comment on this too, is that th this is an acute correction. Oh yeah. And, and so, yeah. you know, one of the things I, that I'm nervous about in the femur is any situ or any of these acute corrections, and, and the clamshell will let you correct crazy angular deformities acutely, is a situation where you're gonna put some tension on a neurovascular structure. And so what I'm thinking of is a situation where we have a lot of apex anterior deformity or like valgus in the de deformity in the femur and you are really stretching them back out or varus in femur, you know what I'm saying? So that you're yeah. actually, in the tibia, it happens all the time where you're doing a big clamshell correction and you lose a pulse yep. a little bit after a big correction and you have to let the patient warm up, maybe take a little bit off and sort of restretch it again or call in your vascular colleagues to mobilize some vasculature for you. But, yep. but I do think the other contraindication is, yeah, I mean, it is an acute correction. There is always a little bit of a risk with a severe deformity in doing an acute correction. So. 100%. That's a great point. It's just hard for me to know beforehand that that's going to be a problem. And unfortunately, I've run into that same situation intraoperatively. So that's a great point. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have the saved um, uh, pictures of doing the osteotomy. Um, we have a correction. Is it a good enough correction? What else uh, is in, in here is, is just sort of supplementing the, the, the environment up at the top using a try, you know, a cement basically to, to fill in a resorbable cement to fill in that defect. I, I'm not sure it was absolutely necessary, uh, but at the time I felt like I wanted her to have a little bit extra um, support in some way for the top of the nail on that screw. But, you know, maybe it would have been a better idea if I added additional uh, screws around the nail, Matt, uh, 
what do you think about adding additional hardware rather than, you know, supplementing the bone itself? So I, I would have done exactly what you did. I would have supplemented for that significant erosion um, because I feel like it, at the very least, the inferior interlocking screw is going to depend a little bit on the quality of the bone in that region. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that's a good technique. I do it all the time when there are large erosions in the head and neck. And um, I think it's very reasonable. It, it's expensive, right? So the yeah. calcium phosphate right. cements are super expensive. And so that's the negative. But, uh, but I, I think from a this is a big surgery. It's going to cost a lot. There's significant resource utilization with a procedure like this. I would hate to blow it for a thousand dollars on calcium yeah. phosphate cement, you know, on not using it because uh, you're concerned about that small extra expense compared to the overall expense of doing a procedure like this. So, yeah. yeah. Despite your really nice insertion angle, you got a little bit of varus, Rafi, there. Yeah. And yeah. the one thing I would say is that hard obviously to control that short segment i definitely use a lot of distractor in this setting with an off off axis pin to, to hold the reduction the other thing we learned from acre a little trick yeah. for the you know for the patients that you're fixing those atypicals and you could also do some eccentric lateral reaming by deflecting that the guide wire and that proximal segment it's a lot of extra work but it could give you a little more space you got a little asymmetry in your cortical diameters there yeah. your cortical thickness that you might have been able to maybe you know tilt that proximal segment a little more neutral it, i'm not criticizing yeah. it's a very nice correction i don't like to criticize but i think uh, <laughs> way that you, could, you could have you know maybe really? got a little more <laughs> neutral position on that top fragment yeah well i'm bear i'm i'm bringing this case uh for a, for a reason because there's a lot of uh this was actually uh it may have been my first or one of my first clamshells that i did uh, a number of years ago after discovering it um and i have learned a lot since here since this time but um but i brought this up because it's it's got a few things that i i probably would have done uh, differently. This is a pretty early post-op. This is maybe the two-week post-op or something. Um, you can see the drill bits in the in the middle segment. You know, you can see how I, I drilled for it, but um, there's really no expansion of that middle segment. So, um, Steve or Matt, what do you think about um, the lack the lack of expansion? Is you know is that is that an issue? They I mean, didn't have iaminous prayers in the hospital, apparently, huh? <laughs> I, I think if you can successfully get the nail to pass through what you need, I, I think it's probably fine. The issue is with bigger levels of deformity that it, you, you really may not be able to accomplish that. And in those cases, you really want it to spread. At least that would be my perspective. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, this gets into a conversation of strain and do you have two simple fractures that aren't anatomically reduced? Uh, so have you created a segmental femur fracture, which is less likely to heal than a comminuted femur fracture? I don't know yeah. for sure. You know, I think it's a reasonable thing to think about. And I, for that reason, I, I do always try to get a spread, but I, I get it. You know, I, I know what you're saying. So that's such a great point because this this is probably one of the differentiators between this and a Sofield, right? Yeah. So Sofield, and there are modifications now uh, that you can find in the literature of the soap field where these are done percutaneously. So you're doing less soft tissue um, uh, injury, but um, but this in this case, uh, no, I didn't expand it. And I love the uh, your your comment about the strain because really it is it's boiling it down to two osteotomies instead of um, multiple osteotomies or or a much larger surface area of them. So. Yeah, that was another part of it that, um, you know, it went down and I went, hmm, okay, it corrected. But um, but as Mark said, maybe I should have been a little more aggressive with the, the lamina spreader, osteotomes, and a pair of pliers. I would say on the other side, though, that the downside in this case of having more spread is that you're going to have a bigger gap between some of your bone segments on each side. So I think there is a little bit of a balance there between having a little more strain versus maybe having a little bit more gap at, at the ends. And, and those both have pluses and minuses, you know? Yeah. In, in theory, this is going to be a little bit more load sharing than, uh, yeah. than, uh, than one that has a longitudinal split down it. Um, so looking at the distal segment, I wanted to, to, to touch on a couple of, uh, of points. Um, Steve, the, the nail trajectory, 
where it ended up. What do you think? So looking at the nail trajectory in the final position, your first inclination would be to say that you have malaligned the distal segment. Now that, although we know for a normal femur that that, that would be true with the nail on the side, we have to look a little closer when we're correcting a deformity because sometimes uh, for the bone to be straight, the nail doesn't end up in the spot it usually would for a normal femur. I will say that I think in this case, it's pretty close. It is in a, probably a little bit of errors, so we probably would want it a little more centered, but it does take a little bit more um, careful examination when we've got a, a very long span, and not, not like a, a malunion of a specific spot, but, but it's somebody that has a deformity over a longer area. You have to look at it a little carefully. Yeah. Well, some final thoughts. Um... Steve, you've advised me or you've given me advice on this before with motorized nails, but I think the same thing applies to uh, any metaphyseal nailing is, um, and I think Matt makes this point, is, is having screws around the nail or additional uh, cross locks through the nail than just the two that are in there. You, have, you need at least two. This is not a simple fracture. The, the, the screws have got to last a long time. You know, I, it's amazing. And I think motorized nails have helped really uh, imprint this on me quite a bit. Um, and I've gone back and looked at some of the open fractures I nailed and some of the really osteoporotic ones and realized that, you know, no matter how many locking screws you put through the nail, after you get like two or maybe three, they seem to do very little in comparison to having just a couple. Whereas having screws that are outside the nail, the blocking stabilization screws, just really make a big, big difference in those areas where we have less control in the metaphysis. So I've, I've certainly, as an individual, uh, have, have moved towards using them more liberally when I think that they're going to help me in situations, especially with deformity correction. Yeah. Um, oh, I put this arrow here. I know we're, we're sort of taking a long time on this one case, but we're getting a lot of the points that I wanted to share about these osteotomies. And, and one of them is... Um, is the treatment of fractures uh, with the clamshell. Now, um, Mark, what do you, I, I've heard you talk about this before, but what do you think about using uh, the clamshell to treat non-unions? Yeah, I mean, I, I, to me, I think it's a nice concept. We, you know, we, we, we do that. I mean, we bypass an area of pathologic bone and we induce bridging healing sort of that incorporates that site. So I actually think that, you know, I find the most utility with it in, in areas where, I, where I'm dealing with really pathologic segment, you know, for example, like a congenital pseudoarthrosis or something like that. But I do think you actually do, you know, I bone graft these, we didn't talk about that. So, you know, I usually do bone graft my transverse sites as well as my, my clamshell site. Mm -hmm. And when they heal, they do get a very nice, you know, sort of, new callus formation and I do feel like you can get continuity that bypasses and sort of envelops uh, a non-united area. They do, they are implant dependent, but many of the things we do uh, are implant dependent. You get an implant dependent union that's quite functional and long lasting. So I actually think it's a very reasonable idea. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, have Matt go through, um, a rotational case um, or what do you think guys do you want to do rotational or do you want to do length How about a lengthening case all right Go on, Matt. but you Sorry, guys Matt. are switching over mark can you comment on how you're bone grafting when you're doing your clamshell like where do you take it from what do you use so yeah, I mean, I, I try in general for femur, I try to harvest the, uh, the intramedullary graft for sure. But I mean, you know, there's situations where there are limitations to nail diameter and size. And I am still a big fan of iliac crest. Again, this is not a grafting that's trying to fill a defect. So I'm just trying to get, get some signal at both the transverse sites and a little bit along the, the, the longitudinal osteotomy. So Typically, I would take intramedullary harvest if it's feasible based on canal size. And if not, I like to go to iliac crests. And then I just, you know, if I need to volume expand it, I might add some, uh, you know, some freeze-dried allograft chips to get a little more volume with that. 
but yeah. I don't, it's not an impaction grafting. It's definitely just like on lay at all the sites. I don't know if other people are doing something different or not grafting them maybe. Well, well Matt makes the point uh, in, in his technique guide about making sure that before you ream, you've got your, uh, your transverse osteotomies completed so that as you ream, it pushes it out through the frac through the osteotomy site. So that's another, and you just make sure that that's filled up before you, you know, before you decide not to, to graft. So. All right, we have 10 minutes. Let's, uh, let's do this. Um, let's do this case. Uh, this is a patient that I met um, uh, a couple times before uh, I operated on her. Uh, this is in a, in a, in a Central American country where the resources are very challenged. She's 20, but at the age of 10, she had a femur fracture and um, she ended up with a, a non-operatively treated, very uh, short uh, externally rotated leg. So she walks with her, her leg um, out to the side pretty much. Um, so um, we'll just ask Steve, uh, in a resource challenged environment, what are, what are your options and what would you do with this? Um, well, yeah, in a resource, um, a relatively poor environment, you really have to look at what the tools that you are, have available, you know. Um, I do think that most, most places, most countries, we will be able to get some kind of reasonable external fixation device. Right. Rails are available generally in most parts of the world. Yeah. And so that probably would be the, the method that you would use in, in that environment here. And it would be uh, infection friendly and adjustable, you know, based on if you don't have perfect fluoro and stuff too. Right. And then would you add another device to it to shorten the time in the frame, a plate or a nail? Yeah. I mean, so I, I do think that the literature in my experience is that, you know, doing, doing lengthenings just with the rail, it's possible. It can totally work, but it's uh, it's a challenge. And I think that if I thought I reasonably could, um, incorporate a nail with it, I probably would if I had that available. Yeah, and so that's where some of the challenges can occur because you may have uh, some nails, you may not have every length or diameter that you want, but um, right, so uh, hey, in the- Rafi, can I ask a question? Yeah, to yeah of course. So what, so what happens, Steve? So I don't have experience with that without, so what's the most common thing we'd see happen if we just try to do a rail without anything? So, so there's a few things. So, um, you know, what I mentioned in the lecture. So first of all, the thing is that these, a monolateral rail, assuming we're not using rings, is all going to be loaded in a cantilever bend. And it's a lot of force on them. They're on, they're on a really long lever arm. So when they pull apart, they tend to bow in the direction they're pulling apart. And that leads to a varus. Yeah. Okay. So you have a couple ways you can accommodate for that. You can either start by hypervalgosizing the femur at the beginning of the transport, or some of them have adjustability at the end where you can make a correction for it. But that particular aspect is, is tough. Um, and the other thing that's tough about whether it's a ring or a rail doesn't matter is that in general, the soft tissue management is tough because there's so much soft tissue for the pins to go through that they tend to be kind of a problem through most of the transport until you're kind of done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It just, it just seems like a lot of these situations, there's been an implant in there, there's a rule out infection. So, right. you know, it just seems like a lot, you know, a lot of times you're not going to have the luxury of being able to afford a transport nail or put something right. to guide, guide the turn, the regenerate. So. And, and you're right. But, and the thing is like, I, I, I had a poster once that was like, uh, a helpful tool in, in times of despair. And that was what I called the rail. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's true. It's like, if you are in a situation where you're like, I really can't put anything in here. This thing's going to get infected and this and that, like it's a headache, but you know what? You can do amazing things with a rail and yeah. it's a very powerful device. And you just have to be vigilant. Uh, they have to be good patients to, to communicate with and, and then you can make them work. Um, she does get a rail, uh, but with an intramedullary nail, this is the smallest nail that I could, could get uh, for her, uh, which is still kind of big. I think it's an eight and it's a, you know, it happens to be a, t a tibial nail, but um, is, that a, is that a problem to have a big nail with these pins? I mean, you know, it, it certainly is harder to avoid having the pins cross the nail. 
Yeah. And it probably does increase your risk of infection to have the pins go, especially if they're not HA coated pins, it, it probably yeah. does increase that risk. I actually did bring some of those with me and, uh, and, and they, they are HA coated, but um, at least uh, I think the distal ones or a couple of them were, but uh, not every one of them was HA coated. Um, hey, hey, Rafi, that was one of the questions I think that the, the day of the lecture was any, I think it was one of the questions yeah. Steve, was one of the tricks for, you know, getting those, those uh, half pins off, maybe Rafi, you could share or what, yeah. I mean, what did you? Sure. Yeah. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll tell you first or what? So um, you do, uh, you do want to have the nail in there and then you can sometimes um, use uh, and, and Mark, this will probably make you cringe, but if you, you can use a cannulated drill bit, you can, you can get a small pin and get it exactly where you want. Make sure it's as far away from the nail and still in good bone. Uh, so you have a, a, a pin first and then you drill over with a cannulated drill bit. I did that in this case um, just to try to maximize the space. And in one of these pins, I think ended up still contacting directly against the nail, but but that's how I, how I would do it is just be as precise as you can in, in trying to separate the pins from the nail. Totally agree. That hundred percent, that was perfect. That's exactly what I would do. Cannulated drill. You start at the far sides on the middle and you, the pin goes in the middle and the HA coated pins do matter. They matter a great deal in terms of protecting against infection. If you have them available. What size pins? Five millimeters. Good. Six. Six. I think these are these are fives. So she's going along, cooking along with her monolateral fixator, and then at about three months, she has a low energy slip and fall, and she ends up with this. Uh, and it really accentuates what was happening, how much force was on this distraction, Steve. Don't you think with that now very various? Yeah, I do. Element. And it also shows to go the amount of the amount of bend that these pins actually have is that they have a very long lever arm. And when she was subjected to a fall of that nature, it was enough that it was able to bend enough to crack against there. Yeah. So now I'm managing this sort of uh, with my with my partner there. Um, I, I didn't want him to to do lateral locking with these pins at that time. Um, I wanted actually just to do a little medial plate, but um, but he he uh, he felt confident that the soft tissues were good. He locked it. Um, and then got the frame off. And then by the time she got to eight months, um, she did well, but you can still see she's got some varus around the distraction or around the, where the pins were. Um, but she's still overall in valgus, just if you look at her limb length uh, alignment there and her foot progression angle gets corrected. So there are definitely, I mean, every time you put one of these rails on, you're gonna have uh, some issues with uh, pins, and as you said, cantilever bending is a is a real challenge. Um, any other uh, comments we want to do before I summarize? I'll summarize. So the take home points of this whole module, the Saturday and today, was to to keep the simple things simple, uh, and complex things uh, for the for the complex deformities. Um, the clamshell is, is in some ways forgiving uh, and you need less math in order to, to correct it. Um, this Saturday, we're gonna have uh, another expert panel discussion with some, some hard cases, uh, some interesting cases on rotation, angulation, length, clamshell. So I, I recommend that you register for that. Uh, the way you do that is through the AONA website. You can look at all of our old, uh, uh, sessions from the last couple, uh, five weeks now here uh, on that AONA. And you can uh, register for, for the Saturday and the following ones uh, just by clicking on the link. Uh, there'll be a, a recording of this that'll be available to those of you who registered in 24 hours. You can get this also through YouTube, through the AO Trauma North America playlist for osteotomy course. So um, I wanna thank the panel for, for this and, um, and We'll see each other on Saturday. So thank you, everybody. Sounds great. Thanks, Rafi. Go ahead and please answer these few questions to give Thanks, us some Rafi. feedback. Thanks.